steal one of these and sneak off to the side so you can see the slides. Maybe we can take the lights down just a little bit. I am going to tell you guys some really cool things about space. Uh, someone asked me, we're going to talk about this planet. I'm sure you can guess what that is in the next slide. So, when I was about 16, it was the first time I had City Girl been taken out to a rural area in Kentucky when there was an actual super dark sky, and we were paying attention to the sky because it was with this little astronomy group. And I could not believe you could actually see the Milky Way with your own eye and not from like special equipment, time lapse photo, nothing like that. So, I made the all face. Which you guys all to see today. And it really kind of crystallized for me that I wanted to do something with my life to explore all of that. And that same summer is when I got to actually look at the planet Jupiter through a telescope. Now, this might not look like very much to you guys, but when you're looking at a planet in real time with your own eye, and you know that light bounced from the sun all the way out to Jupiter, off the planet, all the way back, tumbled down in your telescope to land in your eye, and you're seeing it for real. It was just kind of surreal and magical, and it made it feel like the solar system was this tiny, cozy neighborhood with all this awesome stuff right there in your backyard. And so I grew up, and I went to college, and I got an engineering degree, and I was very fortunate to get hired at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory right out of grad school. Woo! And I've been, thank you, yay! <laughs> I've been there almost 20 years, and it's still a time And I've had a chance to work on four different missions since I've been there. We are here at the Earth. Do you guys know what this is? Mars. That would be the red planet Mars. And so I got to work on the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter, which launched in 2005 and is still orbiting the red planet. You can get it. Yay! Yay! <laughs> and then I spent some time working one more click on the Kepler mission. If you haven't heard of Kepler, please do yourselves a favor. Go home, Google it. It has discovered so many planets outside of our solar system inside our Milky Way galaxy. And now I'm currently working on a mission called Psyche. Give me one more click. And it is going to launch in 2022 to go visit one of the coolest asteroids in our solar system. Scientists think it might be made mostly of metal. One more click. But I spent the last nine years of my life working on the Juno mission, which is currently orbiting the largest planet in our solar system, learning lots and lots about that huge gas giant. Woo! Next slide. And so, Jupiter. We have a bunch of unanswered questions about Jupiter. Lots of space have been there. The Voyagers flew by when I was about four years old. Galileo <laughs> spent some time orbiting it for multiple years. Cassini went by on its way to Saturn. But what one of my favorite scientists says, I'm not going to say their name so the other scientists don't get jealous, one of my favorite scientists <laughs> says that the more we look closely at something, the more questions we have, the more things we realize we don't know and we still want to learn about it. We got a lot of unanswered questions about Jupiter. How big is the core? What is generating? Exactly how is this huge monstrous magnetic field being generated? Those storms that we see on the surface, did they go super deep? Did they stay on the surface? That and many more things we wanted to learn. And so we designed and built a spacecraft to go find out. Next slide. Now, I'm going to give you, in 60 seconds or less, how you go about developing a deep space mission. Step one, scientists ask us questions. Can you give us a click? Scientists will ask questions about stuff we want to learn about. Step two, scientists will get in touch with engineers and figure out a mission design. Can you point a telescope at the thing and find out? Do you have to go all the way there? Can you fly by? Can you orbit? Step three, we develop a spacecraft to support the instruments that are going to get the scientists the data that they need. Step four, you test and test and test as you are putting it together because it's going so far away and something goes wrong with it, you can't go whack it with a wrench and make it work again. <laughs> Step four, you strap it on the top of a rocket that you did not build and you hope those people <laughs> 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 And step five, it's on its way and you monitor it and make sure the spacecraft is doing what it needs to do and gathering all the data and sending it all back so that the scientists can close the loop and answer the questions that they first started out to do. So one, you can all go build deep space missions. <laughs> <laughs> Next slide. So I am a systems engineer, and when we are working with, yeah, well, yes, yeah, systems engineer, what am I, whoops, yes. <laughs> and so what that means is we are trying to build complex systems. If you take a spacecraft, it has telecom, thermal, power, all of these things that need to work together. You will have engineers who are specialists in those areas. 
systems engineers make, need to make sure that we're building them all to fit together and work as one complex whole. And we do a whole bunch of stuff in order to make that happen. And one of them is trying to think of all the things that could go wrong with a mission and then doing something about it in advance. And so we use this tool in this thought process called Fault Tree. You start with a major goal, like, I need my launch to be successful. <laughs> and then you say, well, what are the major things that can go wrong so that your launch is not successful? And there are a bunch of different things, like, the spacecraft is not thermally stable. It's getting too hot or getting too cold. The spacecraft is not generating enough power or it's not storing power. It's a power problem. You can have a telecom problem, all these different things. And then you say, well, what might keep me from being thermally stable? Well, maybe there's something wrong with my thermal hardware. Maybe there's something wrong with my thermal software, et cetera, et cetera. And then you say, well, what could be wrong with my thermal hardware? Maybe a heater stuck on. Maybe a heater stuck off. Maybe a thermal blanket is torn up, blah, 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 blah. And you keep doing this, and you end up with this huge tree that has hundreds of leaves. And for every single one of them, you try to figure out, what can I do with my design so that that will not happen? Or what do I do with my design so that if it happens, this HRAP will survive until we can get in touch with it and figure out what to do about it, right? Lots and lots of work doing fall trees. So we are sending a spacecraft all the way out to Jupiter. Audience question, who knows how far the Earth is from the sun? You can win a prize if you get the answer right. Yes? One solar unit. One I will take that. I'm going to be nice. I'll take that. I'm going to take that. Here, can I throw this to you? Can you catch it? Oh, no. Wow. That's such a bad toss. I'll do that. One more guess. One more guess. So like someone about 29 feet long and 9 feet wide for a single solar array. And that is to generate, all the way out of Jupiter, a measly 500 watts of power, which is about a third of a conventional microarray, but that's enough to run the whole spacecraft. Now I'm going to tell you guys a bit more about our power system on the spacecraft, and then we're going to do a little brainstorming game where you can come up with some things that might go wrong with the spacecraft in terms of power. Don't be scared. Next slide. So that spacecraft is huge, right? And even though launch vehicles are very large, they're not that wide at the top. We actually have to fold up the solar array so that they will fit inside the nose cone of the rocket. And once we launch it, and that nose cone separates and the spacecraft gets off the launch vehicle, it has to fire some pyrotechnic devices to release the solar arrays. They have to come all the way out and latch into place. We have to take the whole spacecraft and point it from the sun so that we will start charging the batteries. And the scary thing about that is you only have like a handful of hours for that all to happen completely without the ground in the loop. And if it doesn't work and your spacecraft runs out of power, then you might as well have launched a very expensive brick that is not going to get where you want it to go. <laughs> that will be a bad day for everyone. So I need all of you guys to pretend that you are systems engineers and you're trying to come up with all the things that can keep your spacecraft from generating power or storing power on launch. Who wants to play? Don't be scared. Don't be scared. Yes? Yes, your actuators might not work. Very nice. Anybody else? They're really nice prizes, like the other ones. Anybody else? Yes. You need to hit by an asteroid before you. I'll take that. We usually worry about getting hit by like micrometeor. Space junk is perfect. Yeah, you ready? Because clearly I can't do this. Yo, that's good. Okay, one more, one more. Yes. Wiring between the solar arrays and the batteries. Yes, very nice. Wiring between the solar arrays and the batteries. I have one more thing in my pocket. You had to be on Yes, the mechanics for opening the solar panels. I forget you guys are good. They're going to hire you all. <laughs> so there are a bunch of things that could go wrong, and we had to think of all of those things and make them not happen. And good for us, on launch day, it all worked perfectly, and the space trap was on its very little way. Next slide. Now, it worked fine on launch day. We actually did have a bit of a power problem <laughs> during the cruise. And so to get all the way out to Jupiter, this took five years from launch. The spacecraft had to do this big loop out past the orbit of Mars and then go back by the Earth to get a gravity assist to get going fast <laughs> enough to get all the way out to Jupiter. Now, when the spacecraft is at Jupiter, the way we designed it is, if this is Jupiter, my finger is the spacecraft, it orbits like this. And so the planet is never blocking the sun 
right? When it's orbiting, great. Right. Now on the Earth flyby, we had to go behind the Earth like this for 19 minutes. The spacecraft was gonna be in complete darkness and have to just use batteries and do its thing, right? Now, if you give me one click, this gentleman, Dan Freely at the lab, one of the very wise souls around the lab, whose job is to go around to all the different projects and make sure that they're not forgetting something key, came to us and said, okay guys, this is the only time in your entire mission that your spacecraft is gonna be behind a planet in eclipse, so I just need you to look at everything super carefully and make sure nothing's gonna go wrong. And we're like, yeah, okay, we will do that. But just so you know, this spacecraft is designed to do this. It has a battery that can last for like two hours. It is based on heritage from spacecraft that go into eclipse behind Mars like every two hours. Like, we're really not worried about this, but we will take a look. So we took a look. We really did. We turned over all the rocks. We looked at our analysis. Six ways to Sunday. We went back to Gentry. We were like, dude, it's fine. It's going to be fine. He's like, no, we'll go look again. We said, okay. We went to go look again. We went back to the camera. like, no, it's going to be fine. On, on the day of Earth flyby, 12 minutes into a 19 minute eclipse, just after our project, our, our mission manager had said to like a live TV audience, the spacecraft has been operating very well since launch. It has no sync modes, everything's going fine. The spacecraft decided it had a power problem and entered sync mode. And this was what we all looked like. This was the unhappy off. <laughs> you have got to be kidding. And it didn't take us very long to figure out kind of what happened, which was there was a little subtle nuance between the way we were analyzing the power profile on the ground and what the spacecraft was doing in flight, plus where we had told the spacecraft to decide it had a problem and like turn everything off and point this little antenna back to Earth. Ugh, that was not good. And you can like, Gentry came over and was talking to us. He was, he was very polite. <laughs> and you would think that something like this would be like a super bad event and there would be no good to come of it. However, you know, we figured out what was happening. We got our gravity assist. That was just physics, no big deal. We're on our merry little way. And in the process of asking ourselves, okay, why did that happen? Like, what did we miss? We learned some things, and we were able to update our operations process, so by the time we got out to Jupiter, we were much more ready to do the science mission. So it was, it was a good thing. Silver lining, in hindsight. <laughs> okay. yeah. Next slide. We got out to Jupiter three years later. We burned our engine for half an hour. We got successfully into orbit. It was a good day for everybody. And it was really thrilling that the world was watching, right? Like there were big pictures on Times Square. People were watching this on TV. Google made us a super awesome doodle. And you give us a click. I decided that that's me right there. <laughs> Fine. And lots of other very interesting things happened along the way. I will tell you if we had time. We do not, so sorry for you. So I will tell you a little bit about the science payoff, right? Next slide. And then one more slide. So remember my last little personal view of Jupiter, through this telescope on the ground. And now this is the beautiful payoff that we got from the Judo spacecraft. Now, no other spacecraft had flown over the poles of Jupiter. They'd all gone by the equator. And so we were the first ones to get to see actually what it looked like. It's a little dim in here. You can't see, but wait till the next slide. <laughs> so the colors are a little bit stretched here, but it is more purple and blue in the middle. And you have the central cyclone surrounded by five cyclones on the south pole. The next slide shows you the north pole of Jupiter. One more click. This is my very favorite image that the mission has sent back, and it came back like in the first several months. So this was taken by an infrared image. The light areas, areas are a little bit warmer, and the darker areas are a little bit cooler. It's still like pretty cold, <laughs> but you can really see the structure in the South Pole. You had this huge cyclone, and these eight really eerily equally spaced storms around it that like, scientists were going like, seriously, is that what's there? Is that okay? And it's kind of amazing to me that going from a teenager in Kentucky staring at Jupiter through a telescope and being able to now have been participating in this mission and put together a spacecraft that went all the way there to show us parts of the planet we have never seen before is just thrilling. And I'm really glad that I get to be one of the people who comes out to tell all of you guys about it too. So that's it. I'll see you in the next